G'day guys, welcome back to the Truest of Football YouTube channels. Today we are bringing back a series that I know you enjoy, The Unpopular Opinion. So, I asked you guys to supply your unpopular AFL opinions through the YouTube community tab. You guys have come through very strongly, as you so often do, and I am going to respond to your unpopular opinions and tell you what I think. Before we crack into it, I do notice that about 60% of the people that have watched True Footy videos over the last month have not actually hit subscribe. That's the highest I've seen that number in a while. If you are enjoying the content and want to see more AFL content, I'd really appreciate if you'd subscribe to the channel and help me grow it. Great, so without further ado, let's crack into your unpopular opinion. Some of these are more popular than unpopular, but either way, we're just gonna have a footy chat. So the first one is D Rocket who says Zach Merritt has been the most consistent midfielder of the last eight years. So to start off, I don't think this is too unpopular. I think when it comes to consistency, Zach Merritt is one of the first names I think of. Um, and at the moment, we're discussing this at a time where he has just you know, got a bit of attention for kicking three goals and having 30 against uh, West Coast. Not a huge goal-kicking midfielder, uh, that being said, but when he's kicked three goals, it's nice to see him in the spotlight. He has been a terrific player. So looking at the last eight years, so going back to 2016, in other words, he's won four best and fairest. They were kind of like equally spaced out. Three All-Australians and probably a number of those as well where he's in the All-Australian squad and didn't quite make it. In that same time period, he's averaged between 27 and 31 and a half disposals every year since 2016. The only exception is 2020, where he averaged 26.2. So in terms of just like consistent output, Zach Merritt is one of the most consistent players in the competition. So again, I don't think that's wildly, you know, crazy. I think Lockie Neal might be another one who has been terrifically consistent. I can't remember Lockie Neal having a real down year. That being said, if it's over eight years, you know, I think Lockie Neal was pretty good when he left Fremantle, but he certainly took his game to the next level, or at least in my opinion. But Lockie Neal is probably a good contender for that. Next one we have from Naga and Marcelo with a couple of St Kilda ones. Naga, first of all, says St Kilda's list needs a complete rebuild. And Marcelo says Darcy Wilson could win the Rising Star. Maybe to start with a Darcy Wilson rising star one, that's a bit of a hot one because Darcy Wilson just played you know, his best game at AFL level, three goals, 21 possessions against North Melbourne. And I think in the rising star odds, he is now second behind Harley Reid, albeit a fair way back in second. Um, I don't disagree. He could certainly win the rising star. The, the unsexy answer here is a lot of it comes down to how many games these guys play because if somebody gets injured, it's going to throw that into chaos. I mean, Darcy Wilson could absolutely win the rising star. Like I said, in the football come down this week, you know, he's shown an ability to hit the scoreboard. He's shown an ability to show up, you know, at, at crucial moments. And, um, you know, I think he'd be a worthy winner. I still think Harley Reid probably will win it if he plays enough games. You know, I think he's been pretty, pretty damn good, uh, as we said. A uh, bit of an understatement there. I do think George Wardlaw is still a candidate for this. He played really well in the same game. He had 22 touches and a goal. The only argument against Wardlaw is will his body hold up? Because not only because of, you know, hamstring issues, but... He's also a very crash and bash inside mid, whereas, you know, Harley Reid and Darcy Wilson, without double checking, both of them are probably getting more uncontested than contested ball. And that might affect Wardlaw's ability to win the Rising Star. So I think it's from those three at the moment. McCurch is probably the next best as well. Um, but that is my long-winded way of saying I think Wilson could win it for sure. Now, St. Kilda's list needs a rebuild. That is a huge call. I think, if I'm not mistaken, Nagar is a St. Kilda fan. I'm going to strongly disagree with this. I think the young core of talent at St Kilda is it's probably not even underrated I think it's well known I suppose at this current point in time the St Kilda aren't looking crash hot but let me throw some names at you first of all Max King is 24 this year and you know should be an elite key forward in my opinion Machido Owens Nazaya Wanganin Miller Matthias Philippou Darcy Wilson Marcus Windhager Liam Henry uh, I also really like Lance Collard and Jack Higgins is barely 25 years old so when you say rebuild it, it implies just like throw it out and start again. Or I think St Kilda are in a position now with this young core. It might be this young core that takes them to the, the promised land rather than the, the group we're seeing right now. Because it's a mature team and they're horribly underperforming. I don't think that's a talent thing. But if I'm St Kilda, I'm not looking at rebuilding, like going to the draft. As it turns out, they might have a top eight pick, you know, the way the season's going at the moment. So that might, you know, sort itself out. They're probably going to add through the draft, but I'd be targeting guys in the 21 to 26 bracket and I'd probably even be looking at free agency. So I'm going to disagree. I think they're underperforming horribly at the moment. They're in a really rough patch of form, but I think that talent there, if they can harness that, that's already a really good group. I don't think a rebuild is necessary. G'day guys, just letting you know that this video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a service that helps connect you with a credentialed therapist who is trained to listen and give helpful, unbiased advice. The prospect of starting therapy can be 
quite a challenging proposition. It may be the case that the right therapist for you and your specific needs doesn't live in the same area as you, or sometimes people find the face-to-face -face aspect of it quite challenging. The BetterHelp service helps overcome these challenges because you can schedule your therapy sessions, first of all, at your convenience, and you can do them via phone call, video chat, or messaging if that's what you prefer. How you get started is you click on the link in the description of this video. That takes you to a questionnaire which helps them assess your specific needs. And in most cases, you will be matched with a therapist within 48 hours. And another helpful aspect of it is if you're matched with a therapist that you don't think is right for you, you can switch to a different one at no additional cost. So if you think you are someone who could benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp and click the link in the description or go to betterhelp.com forward slash truefooty. Clicking that link below both supports the channel, but also gets you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp so you can speak to a therapist and see if it helps you. The next couple are around Carlton, particularly their key forwards. So the first one says, Charlie Curnow is not in the top four, five forwards in the game right now. And Skipper FC says, Harry Mackay has been one of the best forwards in the comp this season and by extension better than Charlie, in my opinion. So I, I think it's a bit rough to say Kerno is not in the top five forwards in the comp because he is leading the common. When you break down statistically the comparison between him and Mackay, I do actually agree Mackay's probably had the better year despite having a few less goals. It also depends when you say forward, are we talking key forward? My mind immediately goes to key forward, but we'll get to that. So first of all, Mackay versus Kuno, 22 goals versus 25. So not much difference, Mackay, considering they're in the same forward line too. Mackay's had a bit more of the ball, 14 and a half disposals versus 13. Um, he's averaging eight marks to 6.2. Contested marks as well is pretty line ball, but bear in mind Mackay leads the competition for contested marks. He's getting a lot more tackles, three and a half tackles to Kuno's one and score involvements is 7.5 to 7.2. Overall, both have kicked, you know, I, I try to see like who performed best in big games, and Mackay stands out because of the Lions um, performance, you know, back in the opening round, but generally speaking, they've both hit the scoreboard in important games against quality opposition. So I think it's harsh to say Kerno hasn't had a good year, but I do agree that Mackay's probably been more of a standout despite kicking less goals. As for the top five forwards of the competition, I think you can make the case they're both in there. The other, like right now, Waterman and Hogan got to be in there. They're second and third in the common. Ben King has kicked a lot of goals this year. Bailey Fritch as well, if you're you know, opening it up to not just key forwards. And even though Jeremy Cameron, you know, he was goalless last week, generally he's probably still in the top five forwards. So it depends how you exactly you frame it, but I think it's a little harsh on Curdo. We've got a couple around the Western Bulldogs, and they're both conflicting. AFL Legend says the Bulldogs list is very overhyped and their problems won't be completely fixed with a new coach. And then Gussie McStevo, great name, says Luke Beveridge is not the problem and needs to stay for another season as the problem at the Bulldogs is more of a list issue. What are my thoughts on this? I don't think the Bulldogs list is overhyped. I don't, I think it's more like there's a high level of expectation because we know the quality that those Bulldogs in question can produce. I still think there's a very high quality core there. Bontempelli, best player in the game, in my opinion. Liberatore is the second best clearance player in the comp. Bear in mind, put a pin in that right now. Like, the concussion thing really concerns me. But as far as talent goes, they got Norton, they got Jamara, they got Trelaw. I know there's been some question marks on Trelaw. He's producing a lot. His ball use hasn't been great. Ed Richards is a gun. Cody Waitman has been, you know, he's been really good this year. I think it's the middle tier that's possibly dro uh, dropped off, you know. Jack McRae used to be a key player. Rory Lobb, you know, maybe not an A grader at any point, but probably should be playing better than he has. We've seen Caleb Daniel be dropped. We've seen Bailey Dale be dropped, if I'm not mistaken. Bailey Williams has been solid, but I don't know if he's the player that he was. And Johannesson, you know, Norm Smith medalist. Again, not a bad player, but I don't, I think maybe it's that group of players that has contributed partially to them dropping off. It's not the top tier, it's the it's the support. The Bulldogs are in a bit of a unique position. It's interesting, like I, I saw Beveridge say, um, and I probably am going to do a Bulldogs video in its own right, but I saw uh, Beveridge say, you know, he doesn't believe in rebuilds, you can't rebuild in the modern game. I kind of think that's very easy to say, you know, in the position that the dogs are in, because they've compiled a whole stack of talent. Some of that has been through good trading and drafting. Some of that has been a bit of luck with your academy and father-son, but... Either way, I think Beveridge probably already knows how good the young talent is. Let me list some names for you. Riley Sanders is going to be a star. Jamari Eugle Hagen. Sam Darcy, I'm a huge fan of. Jordan Croft is another first round key position forward they've added to their list. James O'Donnell's an underrated young gun. Buzzlinger hasn't played a game, but I still think is a high level talent. Guys like Buku Kamas. Waitman is 23. Norton is 24 turning 25 this year. I'm not sure when his birthday is. So that is a whole stack of under 24 talent. In the same way that I just listed a heap of St. Kilda young players, both of these sides are very well equipped to go forward. Whether Beveridge is going to be the right coach is a completely different question. Jace Amazing says, Dylan Moore is a top five small forward. 
in 2024. I don't think this is a bad call. You don't need to sell me on how good Dylan Moore is. From his eight games, he's had 18 disposals a game, five marks, a goal and a half a game, three and a half tackles. The only, you know, comeback to this, I would say, is do we consider Dylan Moore a traditional small forward? I kind of think of him as a high running forward who impacts through the midfield and gets the ball inside 50. And the reason that's important is because if we're going to compare him to other small forwards, the other small forwards that are, you know, well known are the guys who kick goals. So there's Isaac Rankin, I think, is up there. Shea Bolton, both of those guys do play high at the ground. But I don't know if I consider more a real like crumbing small forward. Rankin and Bolton both have more goals this year, as does Paul Curtis, Jamie Elliott, Tyson Stengel, Cody Waitman, like pure small forwards. Bailey Fritch is kind of more of a medium forward. All of them have more goals, but I don't think that is a fair way to assess Dylan Moore. So <laughs> I don't really know what I'm saying here. I'm, I'm always comparing him to other high forwards of the competition. You'd say Isaac Rankin is in that group, you know, someone like a Ben, ben Ainsworth, guys who push up and, and assist at stoppages rather than inside 50 small forwards. Long story short, I think he's an absolute gun. I just, in my head, I find it tricky to categorize him. We got a bunch of West Coast ones, some good input here from West Coast fans. So Sean Christie, friend of the channel, says West Coast are ahead of expectations. Lou Jet says Adam Simpson will remain as coach after all the improvement shown this year. Yeah, to quickly, I'll, I'll agree with that. I think Adam Simpson is fairly safe. We've seen the required improvement. Um, you know, I think a lot has to be said for getting some players back. I've been saying that all off season and was dismissed. And uh, we are seeing a clear improvement there. I, I kind of always said that West Coast are probably still a bottom four side, and that's what they are. Um, but when you take the, all the best players out of a bottom four side, of course things get as bad as they did. So they've definitely exceeded outside expectations. You know, more optimistic Eagles fans, this is probably about right for what we expected. Bearing in mind, I did have a second last, so yeah, I have to agree. Gary Jeffrey says, West Coast will finish higher on the ladder than St. Kilda. Jack Darling and Bailey Williams will be dropped when Oscar Allen and Matt Flynn are ready to play. And then Luke 008 says, Yo, Waterman and McGovern will be in the All-Australian squad. So to start off with the St. Kilda thing, I think that that relies a lot on St. Kilda falling off. Because I think when I look at the two sides, yes, you know, St. Kilda is in, in, in different form and West Coast have had a pretty good month. I am reluctant to back us in too much considering we don't have the squad depth of other teams right now. You look at the waffle and who's supporting that. I think we're getting a lot out of our best players at the moment and two of them will miss this week against Collingwood. So we'll start to see the, the depth exposed and that's where I think we might come unstuck this year. So I don't think we'll finish higher than St. Kilda. As for Darling and Bailey Williams being dropped... Maybe Darling, maybe Darling for Oscar Allen. I think Bailey Williams is too good to get dropped. So I'd probably go with a forward line of Bailey Williams, Allen, and Waterman to start and then have Marrick and Jack Williams as depth. But that, you know, who knows? Williams of the Jack variety might go better than Bailey as a, as a second ruck and, you know, forward. Bailey Williams is the better actual ruck. So we'll see. But there's no guarantee Matthew Flynn comes in and sets the world on fire either. As for Yo, Waterman, and McGovern, as it currently stands, I think if you did a rolling top 40, both of, all three of these players would be in. I'd have Waterman and Yo on the field, to be honest, and McGovern probably a depth key position defender. To what extent can they keep it up? You know, Yo's just hurt his groin, competitive for midfield spots. We'll see, but I like that call. All three have been outstanding this year. Adam says Hawthorne are still a chance of making the eight. I really don't think so. I really don't think so. Now, we did see them last year start, you know, with a couple of sloppy months, as it were, and then come good. I just don't think they have the depth or consistency to really push for the eight. But we might see a year like last year where they come out and start putting some distance between them and the, and the worst teams at the comp. I think that's fair to say. Uh, I just think, you know, it's too competitive for the eight. I don't see it. A couple of Gold Coast ones now. Random Stream says Will Graham is the next Matt Rowe. And Corey Blackledge says Gold Coast were overhyped in the preseason to make finals. They won't finish in the top 10, even with the easier draw. So to start off on Will Graham, he is second in the league for tackles per game. 8.2 tackles per game. And that is that is Rao like Rao is a very clearance heavy and tackling heavy player for sure. Um, by comparison, you know, as you'd understand, Graham doesn't win the same amount of clearances. He's only played five games. He's averaging about three though, which is very solid considering he's attended 44% of center bounces for the Gold Coast Suns. So he looks like an absolute jet. I actually think he might be a bit more balanced than Raul, but I won't go as far as to say he'll be as good as Raul because I think Raul's going to be a gun. As for the overall expectations on Gold Coast, yeah, I was watching Luke Hodge talk about this, I think, on SEN, and he made a good point. You know, why do we expect Gold Coast to improve rapidly? I think I, myself included, a little bit excited about some of their best form. I still had them missing the eight. Um, so the fact that they're languishing at the moment Maybe it's not the end of the world, but I, I do think they've been pretty poor in some of the games against quality opposition. Oz Footy says, Brisbane don't make the finals this year. You know what? 
this isn't a bad take because their injury list is ridiculous. So I've actually written it down. They have five players currently recovering from ACLs. That's absurd. I, I heard again on SEN that they're investigating whether it's the Gabba, but there's never been a problem before. So I doubt it's that. But Kitty Coleman, Tom Dede, Darcy Gardner, Lincoln McCarthy, all out for the season. The fifth player is Will Ashcroft, who's recovering from an ACL last season. They've got Starsevich out for a month, Bailey out for two to three weeks. And Robertson and Answorth out for two weeks. Probably less important players, but either way, the, the depth is starting to erode a little bit. And um, yes, I think this might be a painful second half of the year for the Brisbane Lions. The silver lining is that they could possibly, you know, expose some of the young depth. We've seen flashes of good young players there, like Tunstall is another player that I've noticed that I think could be a good player at AFL level. It could be a silver lining like that. So we'll see. But I, I think Brisbane making finals now looks increasingly tough. Zoc Devoid says, Kulsha Deal will be the greatest number 35 in the 21st century when he retires. And he puts, sorry, Nick Dagos. Um, yeah, by default, I don't think he's going to do that. But very encouraging debut, two goals. Eight disposals, five marks. Uh, for a guy who was taken at the end of the draft last year as a bit of a afterthought father-son, I mean that respectfully, but, you know, Jake Waterman was another. The guys who get bit on with, like, the final pick of the draft. And uh, to debut in round eight and play well, that's outstanding. And a heartwarming story as well. There's some good footage of him in Gunston, um, Gunston telling him he's going to debut. We've got a few Essendon ones now. Tiger Storm 47 says, Nick Martin wins the Brownlow by one vote. And Mario Mann says Essendon will win the Premiership this year. I don't see the Premiership happening this year. I think they are on the right track for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's very easy for me to say probably not. Um, I, I think they need to take a few more scalps. Drawing with Collingham was a good start. They still didn't win. And their, their biggest uh, opponent this year, other than that, was probably the power. And they lost that heavily. They lost to Sydney by five goals and I thought they played pretty well. Uh, either way, they should they should make finals, right? As for Nick Martin, it's not a terrible call. He's top five in the league for disposals with 31.2. He's ranked third in the league for meters gained. And he hasn't had less than 25 touches in a game. And his highest was 44. And Essendon's winning games. So he could pull some votes. It depends to what extent you think Essendon will continue winning games. That will ultimately affect that. And Zach Merritt's in some pretty handy form as well. We got a couple on Nick Dacos and Bond. So Billy Chook says Nick Dacos is an above average player. Top 30 for sure. Def not top 10. Soccer Short says 944. <laughs> Soccer Short's 944 says Bond and Nick Dacos are both overrated. So I'm going to disagree with this. I think, as an aside, I just recently did a video top 20 players in five years. You still have some top tier players in the top 20, and, and I'm sure the top 30 as well. Like You could go through the top 50 and find some A-grade players or players that you'd describe off the top of your head as A-grade. I still think top 30 is probably a little bit harsh with that cost. So, I mean, look at his performance against Carlton. Let's break it down. 32 disposals, 16 contested possessions, and that's probably the balance you want for a guy who uses the ball like he does. He laid seven tackles, he had seven clearances, he had six inside 50s, 626 metres gained, and two goals to claim the medal, and he kicked the goal to win the game. He also attended 89% of center bounces. So, you know, he's not playing on the half back flank anymore. That performance was a pure inside out midfield performance. I don't think top 30 is right. I think as for top 10, that's hard to quantify. The thing we have to also acknowledge, he hasn't had an amazing first couple of months to start the season, but that is a performance of a top tier player. And we know what he can do. I disagree on Bont. I still think Bont is the best midfielder. He hasn't been the best midfielder this year, but I think on ability he is. And, you know, despite not really hitting top gear this year, he's still ranked second in goal assists. He's getting five and a half tackles a game, fifth in score involvements, fourth in contested possessions, and six clearances a game. And like I said, probably hasn't had the midfield support around him uh, other than Liberatore. And, you know, probably hasn't even hit full flight yet. And I think this guy is just so balanced with what he can do. So many ways he can hurt you. He glides across the field. He doesn't look like he's trying, but he's still putting space between him and his opponent. He is tackling. He's defensively minded. He's going forward and kicking goals. Goal and a half a game as well. I disagree that he's overrated. I love him. Rob Max says, Frio look better when Jackson is the sole ruck. Signing both ruckmen to big deals would prove to be a mistake. So they've won two out of three games since Darcy came back, if I'm not mistaken, other than, you know, running into the juggernaut that is the West Coast Eagles. As for signing them both a big deals, I think you have to consider like what else should they have done and what would have any other team done? You know, I think it would have been a crazy risk to say, you know what, Sean Darcy, we got Luke Jackson, you can go away now. Uh, I don't think that's how good football clubs run. I understand the uh, point about having a lot of money tied up in rucks, but there's still the, probably the number one ruck duo in the competition. Uh, my response to here is to give it time. I do think Luke Jackson 
when he was playing as the number one ruck, was having an elite season. And since then, there's been a clear drop in output. But give him some time to, to move back into that role as well and play as a more of a forward who supports by hitting the scoreboard. I totally get where you're coming from, but I still I, would, I think there's potential there. I would give it time. Three-pronged forward line of Amos, Tracy, and Jackson. I think that has some potential now. Cammers says, Alira Lira is heavily overrated. Interesting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I haven't really paid close attention. So I ran some stats on comparing this season to his 2021 season where he was All-Australian. I still think he's a good player, but there has been a clear drop-off. He's averaging three less effective disposals a game, a clear drop-off in contested possessions. One percentage is like 40% down. Contested marks, he's averaging two a game uh, back in 2021. That's down to 0.9. Meters gained is quite a bit down. Intercepts down from 8.7 that year to 6.3. And his super coach score, and again, it's just a silly way of looking at it, but super coach does give you a bit more of an indication than fantasy and that's down from 87 to 65 so there's been a clear statistical drop off and it was a little bit of an outlier that season i think 2022 he was still okay 2023 was reflecting more what he's doing this year by that logic i suppose he is overrated a little bit but uh i still think there is a chance that he, he returns to some of his best football but i suppose he's you know he's not young anymore i think he turns 29 this year we've got a few quick ones to rattle off afl snap says west coast will beat collingwood this week I haven't tipped us, but I have a funny feeling we're going to play well. But the Yo and Waterman outs make me feel a little bit iffy about that. Gaming Wars says Harley Reid is better than Nick Dacos. So the way you phrase that is that he's currently better. I, I can't agree with that. Yeah, it's an interesting one, though. But they are very different players. And it's a little bit like comparing Patrick Dangerfield to Andrew McLeod. Like, they're just quite different. I, th- I think both of these guys do things the other, the other will probably never be able to do. Harley is an amazing contested player, still more of an outside leaning player because his skills and his pace are really good. So you actually want him getting more uncontested ball than contested ball. But he goes forward, he flies for hangers, incredibly hard to tackle, and he can just get that burst separation that even Dacos doesn't quite have. But Dacos can run all day, works really hard from contest to contest, and is also extremely well-rounded. Lays his tackles, probably a better defensive player than Harley at the moment. So I'm not comparing the two at the moment. Nick Dacos is a better player right now. As for who do you want on your team? Well, you know, if, if Reed becomes a bona fide A-grade, A-plus midfielder, and Dacos never fully makes that transition, then you could say that Ali might have him covered, and that's still down to your preference, because I think running defenders in the way that Dacos is are still important. So I don't really have a horse in this race. I don't really care who's better out of them, but I, I certainly would stop short of saying that Reed is better than Dacos right now. Crazy Ninja Gamer says, Jake Waterman has been the best forward in the competition in the last month. I don't know if that's an unpopular opinion, but I feel like it could be. He, he might have been. Yeah. Yeah, he probably has been. Uh, considering like it's his work rate um, that has allowed him to get in so many good positions to take those marks. He's also been pretty clutch in terms of his goal kicking has been good. His field kicking has been good. His endurance is unreal. He covers the ground so well. I think that's fair to say. And finally, Max Hansen says the Eagles 2023 Indigenous Guernsey is better than the 2024 one. Big call. I'll get them both up on the screen so you can look at it. My personal preference is I quite like the 2024 one. It's my favorite but they generally all been nice. So that'll wrap up this month's version of Unpopular Opinions, guys. This is one of my favorite ones. I enjoyed this chat. So let me know in the comments what you think. And for now, I'll say goodbye and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.